This video is sponsored by Surfshark, which is pretty funny considering we're covering Emerald Coast, one of Sonic's- <laughs> Wait, hold on a sec. It's one of Sonic's greatest achievements that just does not get the recognition it deserves. This was the first fully realized 3D level that this franchise had us play, and I swear to god, if one of you brings up 3D Blast, Sonic R, or god forbid starts arguing that the Chaos Zero fight at the beginning was the first fully realized 3D Sonic level, then I'm gonna drop your house right in the middle of this flood. I am talking about behind the character 3D platforming levels, are we clear? <laughs> Emerald Coast was the true beginning of 3D for Sonic, and set the stage for how he would play in this new dimension for decades, serving as a fantastic benchmark for quality 3D Sonic levels. Let's rewind. You're chilling on an afternoon and see your friend flying his biplane that he subsequently crashes into the nearby beach. Funny? Absolutely. Concerning? Yeah, you gotta go save him. BAM! Emerald Coast! Yup, that's the plot. It's just a simple rescue mission for your dumb friend. After plopping down, you're met with a beautiful beach. Look at the color- Look at the colors on everything. It's seriously a lot to soak in on your first time playing, and you feel the urge to hold forward on your analog stick to continue this journey, but fight the urge you're already being tested. If you look behind you, you'll discover multiple goodies that were hidden right under your nose. This has got to be one of the quickest rewards for exploration I've ever seen, because I don't know if you noticed, but you're on a beach, and starting in the middle of a bunch of sand on a beach means that there's got to be a coastline, right? So it's likely for a lot of players to be drawn to the edge of the sand to see where it ends, where they'll find these goodies. Same thing with the rings over here, but you'll see that there's some water in between. This may spark some hesitation, but if you're paying attention, then you'll notice that this water is lighter than the water in the distance, and you can see the floor through it, serving as a welcome invitation to get your feet wet as you walk along. If this wasn't established, then it's possible players would avoid all water at all costs during sections that look more dangerous. And even if you happen to skip this part and have some degree of hydrophobia, then it's no problem because a section up ahead forces you into shallow water to tell you in the most straightforward manner to not be a baby about it. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Holding forward will immediately run you into the ever so important rings for you to collect. Whoa, hold on a second. Didn't the first boss fight have these things too? And when I got hit, I dropped them all. Can't let that happen this time. The homing attack was taught in this boss as well, but you're shown just how powerful of a tool it can be in this opening section via these parasols. I'm serious. These colored parasols only show up in this section of the level, and when you use a homing attack, you'll lock onto them. So if you're screwing around here and mashing buttons willy-nilly, getting used to the game, you're likely to suddenly home in on these things, giving you a measure for how sensitive the homing attack's range is that you may have not noticed in the previous boss fight. This Rhino Bot's an interesting one. It has a slow startup time, but when it goes, it goes. Certainly not a foe to take for granted, but one that's easily defeated by a homing attack or what the heck is this? That is a spin dash. See, in the classic tiles, you accomplish this feat by holding down and pressing A. But when you try to do that here, yeah, it doesn't really work out too well. It's actually the B button in this game, where unlike previous titles, you can spam it to Kingdom Come, easily speeding around and destroying foes like this bot from earlier, but then we've got this monkey bot chucking bombs down at you. It's much too high for the spin dash, but at an easy level for a homing attack. The Rhino can be easily defeated by a bonk to the head as well, but that's fine if one does so since there are other examples of spin dash uses later on in the level. But check it out, this place is quite literally a sandbox for for you to mess around in and learn about the most basic aspects of 3D Sonic gameplay. Up the bridge, another monkey bot is present, also known as a Kiki, but it's on the ground instead of on the high up tree, which is a more threatening position than before, but one that you can easily handle now with your newfound experience. The springs here are a little scary at first glance. Hitting a spring in the classic titles cause you to fly up in the air where you've got to control your landing, but here their layout is pointing at really weird and strange angles, which may cause an old school Sonic player to wonder how the heck they're supposed to control themselves after they touch one. But there are a bunch of rings leading from one spring to the next, and they've been kind to you so far, so if you take a chance on simply touching the spring in front of you, you're sent flying to the next section without worry. Looks like the springs in 3D don't work exactly like the ones in 2D. Good to know. And if you didn't notice, you've got a couple sharks that greet you as soon as you're about to hit the first spring, something this level loves to do, so keep an eye out for that. And before anyone says, Zoom Zyke, those aren't sharks, those are dolphins, I'll 
I'll have you know that that's actually wrong. If we pull up the in-game model for these lads and do a little cross-comparing, you'll find that they closely resemble this obscure subspecies of the great white shark known as Surf Shark, the sponsor of this video. Using it, you can swap the location of your IP address to literally anywhere you want in the world. I'm talking Italy, London, Eggman land. Not that last one, it was a joke, don't kill me. There are countless places you can surf to in order to keep yourself protected from big companies or cyber criminals like this guy or this thing or oh my god doing so will also grant you the ability to access catalogs on websites that are otherwise locked to specific regions even youtube does this sometimes leaving you to go find a mirror of the video you wanted to watch or gather footage from or just give up but if you change your ip to the country it specifies then you're good to go the amount of websites that have gated content based on your location is never ending making this tool infinitely useful as it lets you get the most out of your subscriptions. Use code ZoomZyke to get 83% off a Surfshark VPN subscription plus 3 extra months for free. It's even got a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not satisfied with the results for whatever reason, then you can hop right off without worry. You can check it out by clicking the link in the description below. The rubber bands on this boardwalk are incredibly interesting. Their bouncy nature doesn't harm you nor does it set you up for any more complicated rubber band sections in the future. Cause as far as I know, this is the only place they show up in Sonic's levels. So what's the point of them? Other than the simple fun of bouncing around, you can see that the speed at which you bounce off is a direct response to how fast you're going. If you walk into one, you don't bounce. If you jog into one, you bounce a little. And if you ram into one, you're flying everywhere. It's a clever way to give you a sense for how Sonic's speed interacts with the environment around him. These rubber bands could have just been regular railways, but then you don't get the rush of bouncing everywhere after running at them at full speed. If this ends up freaking you out and you jump mid bounce then you won't fall off into the abyss since the devs placed an invisible wall here just in case you'll instead be exploring this bottom section where a spiked ball is going around in circles guarding a bunch of rings guess not all of them are handed to you for free huh looking around there's not much else besides a spring which you've already seen is a helpful tool it sends you directly past the rubber band section that you fell off of this way if you had trouble with it you don't have to repeat it over and over and if you want to go back and repeat it anyways you can just backtrack a little bit up ahead, you see what looks to be the first loop-de-loop -loop in this 3D dimension. Classic players know that to pass a loop-de-loop -loop in earlier titles, you need a good amount of speed, so it's a good thing you're on a downward slope to this loop-de-loop. -loop. But what these players will notice upon reaching the loop is that this gray panel speeds them up greatly, a big indicator that loop-de-loops in 3D don't always require preparation to clear them and that the devs will help you out if they're feeling kind. After getting launched, you'll land in the safe, shallow water, where you're greeted with a very similar setup to the opening. If you discovered the hidden goodies at the beginning, then this part may set off your radar that something is amiss, considering the sections look very similar. In order to find the hidden goodie, you've got to ignore where the camera is pointing and start walking along the water. When you do so, you'll find nothing but that's part of the challenge this goodie is meant for those going the extra mile because if you walk even further beyond then you'll finally find it i know it sounds over exaggerated and stupid but seriously there are three mental hurdles a new player's got across before grabbing this bad boy so the one up is more than worth it but this isn't the only way to discover it. If you detour to the left up the hill, then you'll find a bunch of grass and enemies, where the camera will sweep up and reveal the 1-Up's location. There's even a white patch here that displays the 1-Up when you walk upon it, which I think is pretty cool. It's this first checkpoint where things start ramping up. Literally. You take the boost panel through the beautiful set piece and I can't take it any longer. Can you just look at this place? This game came out decades ago. It has no business looking this good. Sure, you've got some low resolution textures in the background, but the water, the colors, it's so pretty. <sighs> So you take the dash panel and ramp up, where you've got a huge spike bar just slamming down over and over. This is the first point in the level where you're asked to not go, but stop. And not just to stop, but to be mindful of your surroundings. Because although Sonic here is definitely about cruising at high speeds, it doesn't want you to turn your brain off and just hold forward. There's obstacles to avoid, so don't be a dummy and look out for spikes, you dummy! You don't really know where this downward slope is going, so you kind of have to just trust in it and hold forward, where you're met with not just just one loop-de-loop, -loop, but two in a row. I love it when you can tell the devs are having fun with making a level. They could have just made this a single loop-de-loop -loop like the first one, but one of them had to have said, hey, we already did one, let's do two this time. <laughs> 
I normally don't bring this up in level analysis and maybe I should more, but this level has fantastic speedrun potential. There's a few quick cuts at the beginning, sure, but once you reach the checkpoint we covered, you can actually spin dash jump all the way over to this double loop-de-loop. -loop. The reason why the footage isn't matching with what I'm saying right now is because I'm terrible at this trick, but give it some time, I eventually get it. There it is. Cool, right? What the heck was that? You say, barely containing the crap you just exfoliated? You dash forward as it crushes the water underneath, causing tidal waves to rock the bridge you're on up and down. And before you know it, you're running away from it. It being a massive orca that's now obliterating every flimsy board you run along as you pray you don't end up a fossil for marine biologists to discover decades later. By the end of it all, you're catching your breath and you can only think of one thing. There was a goodie back there I missed. I really want you to think about what Sonic just experienced right now, because from his perspective, just starting this level, he sees it as a relatively peaceful coastline. Heck, he even says himself, All I have to do is cruise this coast. So the fact that he suddenly thrust into a life or drown situation on what should have been a peaceful jog by his standards is downright terrifying to him, but hilarious to us. Also, I freaking love this section, by the way. And no, it's not because you can now walk around the spike bars or discover some hidden goodies by looking left. What do you take me for? It's because of instead of bouncing from spring to spring climbing up this mountain, you can spin dash up it, which is easily one of the coolest things I pulled off as a kid. The fact that the physics let you do this is awesome and an amazing skip that you may think to do all on your own. After reaching the lighthouse, you enter this tunnel where you... What a nice breeze. Sonic, I doubt you're feeling much right now. The complexity of this 3D environment gets some spotlight here, where instead of the relatively flat land you're used to, you've got curved land that goes up into a wall formation. This first wave you run through is meant to show you that running along walls is possible given the right angle, and gives you the courage to attempt it on a much bigger wall next. You don't have to take up the challenge and can stick to the lower route, but it's pretty clear the devs want you to make an attempt considering you'll be rewarded with double the rings for pulling it off. With a little speed and elbow grease, you're running on the wall, collecting rings and some power sneakers. In the distance, you can make out a hole in the wall, your final obstacle towards mastering the wall run. If you control Sonic well enough, then you'll enter it and skip a huge part of the level and nail the next checkpoint. It's an exhilarating skip that's an awesome reward for trying out a new technique. We're gonna check out what the lower route provides now, but you can probably guess that's not going to be anything nearly as cool as what we just saw. And you would be right water. You're subjected to the embarrassing task of hopping from platform to platform in a slow and sluggish manner. What's easily the best part about this is that you can see the much cooler top route right above you. Bet you wish you did the wall run now, don't ya? If you somehow mess up the platform jumps here, then you'll dive underwater. But don't worry, not many people know this, but Sonic can't actually drown in this game. I lied. As if the devs haven't hammered at home enough how much the lower routes suck, you've got a bunch of spike bars slamming down over and over, grinding your speedy session to a halt. Sure, you've got a ring box, but that doesn't really wash out the bad taste in your mouth from everything. Down this hill, we've got some more wall running, followed by another double loop-de-loop. -loop. And man, is it more stylish than the previous ones. I've gotta say, it's a little heartwarming to see a trope of Sonic's classic titles persist in the 3D realm. They could have easily done without loop-de-loops here, but decided to make the conscious effort to include them because, well, that's Sonic. I also like how the punishment for not wall running here is a lot more obvious obviously bad than before, because at first it was just less rings and a worse route up ahead, but here it's pretty clear that the devs really want you to wall run. There are some pity rings if you fail the wall run or opt in for not doing it, but collecting them is a pain and gives off the same vibe as a rich person throwing down money onto peasants. Assuming you're not a nerd and can hold forward properly, you'll come across two huge structures, which look like jungle gyms from afar. One can argue that the first act of this level was more based on moving within the x-axis of the 3D plane, whereas the second act focuses more on the y-axis and how much control you have over your height. It makes a great effort to show you just how far your speed can take you, whether it be straight up walls like this one or taking a looky over at a future section and blasting over there as a self-made shortcut. As if the shortcut alone wasn't already a reward for experimenting with your speed, there's a one-up that appears here, shouting you out for a job well done. If you didn't do that, then you make your way through these tight crevices, a much more restricted section than what you're using to, and then you come across a checkpoint, which is something you'd miss by taking the big shortcut, 
But look, taking shortcuts comes with risks, so I'd say it's an even trade. The structure you come across is incredibly tall, with seemingly no way to traverse it like normal. There's springs everywhere, weird numbered panels, and a stupid monkey that keeps throwing bombs at you. Stop that! This new panel mechanic may be a little intimidating at first. When you jump on it, nothing happens, but jumping while on it sends Sonic flying to another panel. If you're not prepared for this, you're gonna inevitably fall, but there's nothing to worry about. You land on the safe ground below. What you'll notice is that the game doesn't force you to return turn to panel number one. It puts you directly in the middle of the dash panels that you can then take back to panel number one to give it another try if you want, and a spring, which bypasses this mechanic entirely in case you're having too much trouble with it. Speaking of which, there's a small orb of light here that teaches you exactly how this mechanic works, and it just so happens to follow my preference of tutorials where it lets you move around while it's teaching you. I was never a fan of being stopped dead in your tracks while being explained something that can be summed up in a couple sentences, but maybe it helps you focus so that's a bit more subjective. Succeeding the inputs on the panels has some cool shots of Sonic launching from one to the other, finally reaching the tippy top of the structure. If you ditch the panels and took the springs instead, then you end up in the same location, so there's no big fuss over which mechanic you choose to take this time around. The first spike bar you came across couldn't really be walked around, but the one by the coastline could. These ones, on the other hand, are a mix of the two design choices. At first glance, they look like they resemble the first spike bar more, where you can't get around them, but in actuality, they're more like the second spike bar, since with enough speed and precision, you can jump around them, saving you some time. Believe it or not, failing this skip won't result in death despite there being ocean below you, and that's because the devs put in a safety net right below this section where you'll start floating in midair, allowing you to return back to the main structure for another go around. They could have easily let you fall to your death like many other parts of this level where you aren't saved as you fall into the water, but here was a special occasion where they felt that falling and dying was too large of a punishment for you attempting to do something cool, and I think that's pretty wholesome. As you run down the hill, you loop around, blitz through a path, and dive through a hole as you land on the sunny sands ahead. There are no enemies nor any obstacles, just a clear, beautiful beach that you run along as you soak in its peaceful nature and the freedom that accompanies it, completing your exhilarating journey to save your dumb friend. And honestly, cheese aside, what's more Sonic than that? Thanks for watching, check out Surfshark in the description below, and I hope you have a great day. Take care.